My name is Paul Vermeulen. I'm here with my customer, Anna Jung, and uh, try to give you a little bit about what we're going to do here. So uh, I'm a senior data engineer at Pivotal. Uh, I've been working with my customer, Anna Jung, from Healthcare Services Corporation. This is Anna. And we're going to be presenting to you, uh, uh, you know, high-performance uh, cloud-native APIs or applications using Apache Geode. The uh, agenda for today is the first thing we're going to do is uh, Anna's going to give you a little bit about herself, what she does at uh, HCSC. She'll also tell you about who HCSC is and their business problem. And then after that, I'll talk a little bit about the architecture that was deployed or employed to, uh, to uh, take care of this business problem. And then we're going to look at some pseudo code that we've done. And then we're going to have a demonstration. Then we'll open the floor up to Q&A. All right? Anna, you want to flip it for a minute? So what is a cloud native application? It is about how applications are created and deployed, not where. OK, you should not even concern yourself about that. It has to fit in the 12 manifesto, 12 factor manifesto, how you build uh, the rules for building uh, cloud native type of applications. And the last thing, it must be a microservice. OK, any questions about that? So I'll turn it over to Anna to tell about herself and HCSC. Cool. Hi. My name is Anna Zhang, and I'm a developer at HCSC. Healthcare Service Corporation is a health insurance company that offers a variety of health and life insurance products and related services. Um, HCSC is the largest customer-owned health insurer in the U.S. and the fourth largest health insurer overall. Um, HCSC operates Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans in five different states, Illinois, Montana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. And we have over 15 million members and 21,000 employees um, in those five states. Um, HCSC is over 80 years old and recently went through a change to adopt test-driven development, paraprogramming, agile um, programming methodology to provide more efficient experience for our customers. So because HCSC is over 80 years old, um, there were a lot of technical debt built up. Like what had worked for us in the past did not work anymore. So one of the problems that we ran into was that the service that is responsible for getting member information was an inquiry service, not an information service, um, which meant the consumer of that service had to interpret their, the data on their own. So that meant that the consumers would get different answers to the same questions from the different applications. Another problem that we faced was that it was a SOAP service and it was very heavyweight and hard to use, especially for the mobile app. Um, so the SOAP service, um, we had to make three different calls just to get the member information. And the response that it got was like this giant XML with hundreds of elements that only like selected few understood what those values truly meant. Another problem was with performance and scalability. Um, our, so as we grew and we had more customers, more data, more traffic, um, our traditional database failed to scale and um, perform on demand. So to solve all these problems, we decided to create a true information service using REST implementation, Apache Geode, and Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, now I'm going to pass it to Paul to talk about why we chose these products. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Uh, what we decided to do is uh, we put in a RESTful API service that did all the microservices uh, that we're running when using, uh, we were using, uh, excuse me, Gemfire as our data store. We were using what we call data aware functions, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we look at the code. Uh, we also had different kind of consumers. We had uh, consumers that were already in PCF. We had uh, a lot of mobile applications that were coming on board, and then obviously the traditional consumers. And so, again, what is a microservice? It's a collection of small services. It implements business capabilities. It's run in its own uh, process space. It, uh, the API is the HTTP interface. And the good thing about it, it can be deployed, upgraded, scaled, and modified and restarted on its own, okay? So those were driving factors as we looked at implementing this type of implementation or this service here. Uh, cool. 
Okay, why do we pick Cloud Foundry? Uh, obviously, because of the fast application development and deployment, that was a key thing. We did continuous integration, okay? That was key. Uh, so we deliver, try to do it on a weekly basis, new code, new functionality. Uh, it's DevOps friendly workflows were very important. And the integration with various different cloud providers. Uh, the customer chose uh, a certain cloud provider and does fit very well with this uh, implementation. And lastly, the integration with the Spring Frameworks for developer productivity. Now, why Apache Geode? Well, the scalability of, of Gemfire, or the Geode cache, is one thing. It was very important. Continuous availability of Geode, that means we could actually put new updates, uh, do different things without bringing down the cluster and keeping the Geode running constantly. The high performance reads. This is a read heavy application. It's very quick because of all the data in memory. And so we have, that was a big need that we had. Also, the caching patterns are a little bit different because of future uh, microservices that we wanted to do it allowed us to do different kind of caching patterns look in the future. And the ability to clone microservices performance and reliability were important to us as we looked at impl implementing new microservices or expanding the uh, scalability of the microservices. And then the isolation layer for uh, making the backstore changes. So what we could do is make backstore changes. And, the way, and uh, there'll be some other speakers from HCSC to talk about how we load this data. And uh, I'll put that plug in a little later for you guys. And then obviously, again, going back to the integration with the Spring Framework was very helpful for the developer productivity. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Anna for a minute. She's gonna talk a little bit about the demo. So we're going to show you a demo overview. And in our demo overview, we're going to share code snippets of the REST client and the component of the server. The REST client can be either independent or a Spring Boot application. And it will have a controller that calls the Apache Geode function. As for the server, that's where the function is defined. And we divided the function into two, like um, one for client and one for the server. And we also added abstract classes to make it easier to add new functions in the future. So let's look at the client code first. Um, so this is an example of Spring Boot application class. Um, so this is the minimum code you need to run a Spring Boot app. That Spring Boot application annotation that you see there is how you tell Spring Boot to configure Spring based on the jar dependencies that you define in either BuildGradle or a POM file. And in the main method, this, you use Spring Boot Spring application that run method, which tells um, Spring to launch the application. And that run method takes a class as an argument. In this case, we're passing in customer order client application, which tells Spring application that this is the primary Spring component. So this is the Rust controller, the client Rust controller. Um, so Spring's approach to building RESTful web services is to have a controller responsible for all HTTP requests. So that REST controller annotation is how you tell, how you mark a class as a controller class. So in this example, we have one method customers, it's a get for customers, and it calls customer list provider dot execute. And that customer list provider is the Apache Geo function for the client. Um, now let's take a look at the server side. I'm going to pass it to Paul, who's going to talk about the customer list provider. Thank you, Anna. OK, so what we did for the client, we wanted the client to really not know what's going on. So we basically did a uh, client function provider. This provider did a couple things for us. Obviously, it has a function ID that's going to be called on Geo to run. We have a region name. Since this is a data aware function, it has to run our region. OK, so that's going to be the region that we're going to run on for the uh, function that we're going to run. Also, the ability to put filters in there, whether we want to get one customer or a list of customers, whatever it may be. So we want to be able to filter that down. And then uh, let's take that. Let's look at the abstract provider here. The abstract provider, really, the main thing here was just to do the, the function execution here. And if we ever wanted to change anything, we could make changes here. But this is a pretty light client implementation and really didn't have to know much except for what we gave them. There are some underpinnings that you have to do, obviously, because this is a client uh, server architecture. So there is uh, how do you talk to the locators and different things like that to get the, uh, the cache and the regions and different things like that. So that's kind of wired. That's not shown in any of these demos or any of this code. 
but that's, that's in there also. But that's a very lightweight that was done inside the, uh, the PCF framework. OK, and I think uh, you're going to take the next one. The next thing we're going to talk about is really how we uh, did some TDD on the server side. And please, Anna. So let's talk about how to test a function. So what we're testing here is the server side function called customer list function. Um, all Apache Geode um, implements a class called function, which has a method called execute. And that execute takes an argument as of a function context. Um, so I wanted to mention that because the function context is one of the things that you have to mock because um, and right now we're um, we're using region function context because we're testing a data aware function. And a few other things that you you have to mock is the query service and the query because um, that's how you get the data out of the regions. And the last thing that you want to mock is the select result, which is the result that you get back from the query. Um, in this case, we're returning entry of customer key customer because the customer list function grabs the data from the customer region, which is made up of those two things. And then in the setup, that's where you want to configure the mocks, like um, as I mentioned before. Now to the actual test. So we're testing that customer list function returns all customers. But to do that, we need to um, know what is being sent to the result collector. And that is why we're mocking result sender here, because that gives us a way to um, capture what is being sent. So after that, you also want to um, configure the return behavior of the result, which is your expected. So right now, it's getting it from get all customers, which is a helper method, which you can't see on the screen, but it returns a list of customer IO object. Then um, you actually want to call the method that we're testing, which is, um, as I mentioned, is the customer list function that execute. But in our example, we're calling process request because we actually divided the execute function into two different validations and business logic, and process request is where the business logic is. So that's why we're calling process request there with the reason function context. Then you use the argument capter to capture what is being what's being sent to the result collector. Then um, just write an assertion on the object. And in this case, we're saying customer IO ID should equal customer one, customer IO get name should equal demo person, which should match what you are getting back from the get all customers. Um, now let's actually make this test pass. So I'm gonna pass it to Paul, who's gonna talk about the actual implementation of the function. Thank you. Okay, the server side function, uh, here's a customer list function. And obviously, we're, we have an abstract service function. We'll talk about that next in a moment. We define the region because, again, this is a data aware uh, function. The process request, that is an abstract from the abstract service function that we give the customer. We can, this is where you can plug in whatever you'd like to plug in here. What we're showing here is we're selecting uh, a result set from all the region. Each, each this is broadcasted all servers in the, in the cluster and each server is running this query on their local data set. And then uh, basically we get a result set back. There's two ways that we did this in this demonstration. We're just showing that we're iterating over the result sets and returning that back by saying get results, send result, and then the final result, the last result, and that knows we're completed. Using the uh, keys that I talked about or the filters, this is where we would actually do the filtering here to return, return back what we really want to return back, if that makes sense. And I should also show the abstract side. Okay, on the abstract side, so we have the execute function that calls the uh, validate request and the process request. We showed you the process request on the previous slide. Now there's some other settings we have. The get ID is the ID for the function that we're going to run, okay? The other has result. This says, do I return a result? Is a Boolean true or false? And since we are returning results, this is true. And then we look at HA. What is HA? Uh, we set that to true. In the event that we lose a server as we're querying this in the meantime, so what will happen then is this will be requeued, the results will be cleared out and requeued unbeknownst to the client 
and we will execute this again, this, this uh, function, to get back the results. So in the event we lose a server while we're executing this, this is what HA provides for you. The last one is optimized for write. That was false because we're not doing any writing here. This is just a truly read function. With that, uh, I'm going to turn it over, and Anna's going to give us a quick little demo that we have, uh, and I think we may have beat the time, so we'll give some time to somebody else. Anna, please. Yeah. So I already have the client running. I'm going to show you a Swagger page. Um, if you're not familiar with Swagger, it's just a library that helps you visualize and interact with API resources. So in our controller, we have five endpoints. Um, the load and the clear is just there to, um, oh, you can't see that. It's just there to help us test these um, endpoints. So in our um, example, we actually use the customer endpoint. And what's happening behind the scene is the same thing that I showed you in the REST controller side. The slide, um, it just calls the Apache Geo function. So I actually have to load first. Then if we trigger this, then you get you see that we're getting response back. <laughs> Pretty sophisticated demo, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and same with items. It's calling a different function and it returns a different objects back. Cool. Um, now let's go back to the slide. So to learn more about um, how HCSC has been using Apache Geo, please check out this related sessions, um, Apache Geo Data Movement, which is on Thursday, and how to continuously integrate and deploy using Apache Geo, which will be tomorrow. And HCSC is Divisional Vice President of Digital Delivery, Mark Ardito, will be giving a talk during the keynote on Thursday. So please also check that out as well. And that's it. And that's awesome. Cool, and that's it. Um, Any questions? Any questions? Anybody have any questions regarding this? Yes. Yes, I have to run the mic over to you so we can record the question as well. Yeah, just a quick, quick question. Um, I saw an optimized for write um, uh, Boolean there. Mm -hmm. um, what does it actually do when you set it to true? Oh, and so if you're writing data, in the event you have any issues, it's going to be optimized for write. So it's just, if that function does write, uh, using that will make, ensure it gives you some more flexibility for the high availability of the writing is the main reason for that, okay? Mike, uh, you want to say any more about that? You, you know more about the, that, but... So on the, when, when data is sharded on Apache Geode, there is a notion of a primary and some number of secondary nodes. When you put optimize for write on a function, it will execute that function on the primary, always. If optimize for write is false, it's free to run at any place where that region exists, including on the backups. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Hi. Uh, actually, I have a question about the, uh, uh, since it's, I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be really huge data, which is in the geode, I guess, because it's a customer data. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, is there any problem that you face, like that huge database keeping, I mean, basically in cloud? I'll let you address that. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, I mean, like, uh, the database is huge, and how do you manage in your, how it's going in PayPal Cloud Foundry or, or whatever you're using? Are you getting my question? How's the data getting into the yeah, I mean, like, uh, how is the performance dealing with the huge data? Keeping in Cloud Foundry, normally they are the very small. Uh, as far as the performance from, from Cloud Foundry to yeah, to, oh, obviously it's the speed of the network. I mean that's the main thing here. But we have not seen any slowdowns. I mean it runs very very fast. We're talking uh, milliseconds, really small milliseconds, uh, less than about twenty to thirty milliseconds for these requests. It really depends too on how big the filters are, those type things like that. But we were looking probably at a 20 to 50 millisecond range. Okay, All right. it, it really depends, but that's uh, 20 milliseconds would probably be a good average. Okay, thank you. Any other, yes? Back here. Could you explain the reason why you use a, a function instead of a query from the client? Uh, yes, I can tell you, the, the reason being that you want to run a function is First of all, as a client, 
if I'm doing this, I've got to maybe do a lot of serialization. I've got to go out there, make the request, and handle that. Or if I broadcast this function here, if instead of doing a query, a query's going to go across everything. It is more efficient for Gemfire, as you do a data aware function, to push this out to be closer to the data to run your query. That way you, you alleviate having to pull a lot of result sets back over the wire to the client, and you pull back only what you need, and you really run this on the server where it's truly meant to be done, okay? So that was the reason why we looked at this. You know, I've seen other customers do like different things, like CQs and all those different things. Those work well, but they can really be bottlenecks in the future. So having something like a, uh, you know, a function going out there, running it across all members, it, it really is, it will, I guarantee it will speed up things trem tremendously. Yeah, but the thing with, uh, with Spring Data Gemfire, uh, we don't use function, we just use query like GPA, something like Spring Data, right. so we don't need function and we retrieve data the same you, way. You don't need function, like I said, yeah, I, I agree with you, you could do it as a client. Their implementation was we wanted the speed and we wanted the, the reliability and the ability to use functions because if you look at a function, the whole idea is to run this closest to the data. That's the best thing you could do for Gemfire instead of transporting all this data over the wire and different things like that. So that was our choice that we did it. Uh, I can understand what you're asking, uh, but I would still say, you know, if you look at use cases, I would look to a function because I think you're gonna see better availability in the future as your nodes start to expand. If you had to add more in the cluster, this is a better approach to doing that than, than a query. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yes. Excuse me, uh, my name is Timothy. Uh, my question is, do you support partitioning? If I have a big data set, can I partition my query when I send it? Yes, these are all, everything in the regions that we were showing here, these are partition regions that we're running. We're not running any replicator, they may have one replicator region, but I don't really know what that's really used for. I, don't, I haven't seen any use cases for that. I know we have one, but all the data is really all partition regions that we're using. And that's where you're going to get the data where, you know, if you, if you run a, a function on a replicator region, it's only going to run on one server anyway, okay? Because that's it's only one part of the data, so it's going to go to one copy of the data and run it. This gets, obviously, because you've got data spread across all the clusters, and so with partitioning, this is a good way to use a data aware function because you pass it down to that partition on each. I, I miss that. How do we set partition? Let's, when, you, you, when you configure Gemfire cluster, you say this is a partition region, and you can sit there, how many redundant copies of this data do I want? Okay, uh, there's a lot of different uh, parameters you can set up, but one of the things is how, you know, how big this is. Is it co-located with other regions if I need to do transactions or different things like that? But most of the time, it's, it's set up and, and you, you just define it that way. And then it really depends. You can say, I want to have it persisted to disk. I want it to be, as I said, uh, redundant copies uh, from zero, no copies, or to three copies that I can have out there in the event I lose it. Uh, so it's really in the configuration side of this, whether it's done with uh, Spring Data Gemfire on the, on the, on the uh, cache server side, uh, or it's done through the traditional uh, XML or through cluster configuration in Geode. I, 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 I should walk down there. I can hear you better if I did that. So. I guess what I'm trying to understand is, based on your data model, you yes. can configure your partition and then send it, send the query to have optimized query. Right. Okay, that's what I'm trying yeah. to understand. Okay. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. So it's something that you can configure? Yes. Okay, good. I want to get down here better. It's too bright up there. <laughs> Any other questions? Did you have to deal with uh, changing schema if you do what was your versioning strategy? Uh, and uh, what about the schema? I'll let you address that. I haven't been at the account that long to really gone through any schema changes that you've gone through when you're looking at changing the region makeup. Have we done anything there? Are you aware of? No. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I mean, the key thing is if you want to do this, I, I would recommend that you use PDX, okay? PDX is going to be out there. It's pretty easy then to adopt. You can add new fields, okay? I can delete fields. I can't change types of field, but I can, you know, so if I'm looking at a PDX instance and I'm adding new stuff, then that's fine, okay? It's pretty easy. Or if I'm deleting data, I can say that. But if I change a type, I've got to reload that data. 
okay, because it's changing, like if I take a chite from a string to a Boolean or stuff like that, I've got to be able to change that. But if you've done your homework on there fairly well, you can sit there and say, okay, I can add new fields as PDX, it's unannounced to me, and it's just the server that's going to say, now give me all the fields in a PDX instance. I can iterate over those fields and return the results back to the customer or to the endpoint. That makes sense or not? Okay. I was wondering, um, how, so how, how the, is this one cluster set up and you have multiple microservices going after the cluster or you have? Yes, uh, okay. we, have, we have one cluster. So uh, in production, the, it's about 20 nodes, 18 servers and two locators. Okay. So if I want to really separate those microservices, not coupled with my cluster, um, anytime I change it, now we have a dependency on the cluster. Um, is, is that doable? Or it really those are partitioned? Or you have dependency on the cluster and the services are dependent on the data? So how the changes are deployed? Yeah, I, I, we've run into some issues here when you okay. do this because now you're getting some, some versioning issues. Yeah. Okay, and so the implementation I've been talking to some of the developers about how I'm doing this is to get away from trying to do all that stuff and, and come up with PDX and come back and answer it that way. Get away from a lot of the serialization that's going on. Their request has a certain uh, payload. That object has to be serialized to come back across. So I'm trying to say, why do we need those type things? Why don't we do something string-based or something? You know, JSON, that's, that's, that's can, primitive. Can you, can you save us a JSON objects? Those? Yeah, JSON yeah. objects, yeah, definitely. And okay. PDX to JSON is, is pretty easy saying PDX. I just want to make a JSON object out of it, return it. Thank you. Uh huh. Oh, we have one other question over here? One more over there, All right. I'm staying away from those lights over here. You keep talking about Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Do you run this inside Cloud Foundry or out? And uh, do you have any experience with doing data replication across multiple sites? Okay, uh, Gemfire, our geode, is run uh, outside of PCF, okay? Uh, we're standing up uh, an Azure uh, uh, Disaster Center right now, DR site, that we'll be replicating to. But right now, we currently don't have any data replication going on, but we are standing up a WAN implementation as we speak right now. So it should be done by the end of January, and that will be running on Azure. We have one more over here. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us like your top two challenges that you faced throughout this project. I would assume that you didn't reach 20 milliseconds at shot one. What was your initial performance and how did you reach 20 milliseconds? Okay, I, since I'm fairly new to the account, this was done before my time, so I'm gonna have to turn that over to Anna. Hopefully you can answer that. If not, I have Jeff Charing, who was the original uh, architect on this. He could probably tell us a little bit more on that. Jeff, you wanna speak to that? Yeah, so to answer your questions, um, how we achieve the performance is really by modeling, how to partition the data, and how to make sure that when you make a request, the, the reason this is a high performance API doing a function call and we want to do on the function side, so every request is routed directly to where the data is at. So we design in such a way that the, the data model, the keys, and, and then the, the data where functions all line up proper. And of course, we have to do some tuning because you know, we depend on some queries. So we still have to apply indexes and stuff like that. So when we, we also did a lot of performance testing with the data aware function when we did executions without index, sometimes we're getting like over 100 milliseconds. But once we apply index, uh, we have like 50, 60 millions of records. Uh, our request and response can get it down to approximately 10, it's 10, 10 20 milliseconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are talking about really heavy bulk loading like hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of requests per second and stuff like that. So I'm sure that this pattern can be applied to various use cases and business case. So I hope that answers your questions. So this is that way we have these presentations <laughs> to showcase this, how we are using it. I mean, we're available if you, know, if you need to speak, we'd be glad to talk to you uh, offline or whatever, okay? That was a pretty good Q&A session there. Oh, that That's was all great. we have. Thank you all very much for your time. We do appreciate it. Have a great day, okay?